Hello, Bible readers. Chapters 17 and 18 of Revelation are again one unit that concentrate on the fall of Babylon. Quite the images in these chapters as an angel carries John away in the spirit to a wilderness where John sees a woman on a scarlet beast and on her head is written a name, a mystery, it says, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints. I mean, wow. These two chapters stand out, of course, from the series of numbered visions in that there are not seven of anything, seals, trumpets, bowls, or anything else. And yet this is not an interlude. As you might remember, the two interludes we have talked about, they were about the church this is a zoom in, you could say, on the woes we've already heard about multiple times now. These chapters drill down into how this judgment brings down Babylon and what that kind of feels like. There is lament in chapter 18. So an angel carries John away in the spirit, as I said. Well, that's going to happen again in chapter 21 in the exact same wording. And then, in chapter 21, the angel is going to say exactly the same thing as here in chapter 17. Come, I will show you. And then, so this fall of Babylon is meant to sound like and feel like a mirror image, an opposite side of the coin image between the fall of Babylon and the vision of a new Jerusalem. So these are the two things that John really wants to contrast against each other, is the fall of Babylon and uh, the descending of a new Jerusalem from the heavenly places. And as the new Jerusalem receives John's greatest details of salvation, we're about to get into that in the next post, Babylon's fall is where we read about the most details of judgment. Now, I found this to be very interesting and I think very important, that the angel carries John to a wilderness. We could do a lot of work on the biblical concept of wilderness, it's where Moses is when God appears in a burning bush. It's where Israel goes after being freed from Pharaoh. It's the first place the Spirit takes Jesus after Jesus is baptized. Wilderness is a character unto itself in Scripture. And that John is uh, taken there is important because wilderness becomes a place of clarity for Israel. Professor Boring calls it a place of refuge for the people of God. And it's in the wilderness that John, here in Revelation, sees Babylon clearly for what it truly is, an alluring prostitute. And remember, Babylon is Rome. Not only Rome, John never explicitly says Rome, because as usual, he wants his imagery to not mean just one thing. Rome itself is after all, is not just one thing. Rome is a goddess, Roma. There's a city of Rome. There's the Roman Empire. Rome is the Caesars and the Caesar cult that grew up around uh, the, the Caesar's power and glory. So John doesn't want to boil his imagery down to just one aspect of first century Rome. But make no mistake, the Rome of his day is what John is pointing out to his churches in Asia. Like, in particular. The most specific description of Rome and her relationship to John's audience is given in the description of the beast that the woman is seated on in verse uh, verses 8 to 12. The seven heads, the seven kings, would have been heard as obviously referring to the city famous for its seven hills. And at this point, there had been, no surprise, seven Caesars, five of whom had died, Notice the beast represents a resurgence of chaos that's been held back since creation, but now has a moment in the sun, but it's going to be destroyed soon and very soon. That's the message John wants to get across here. This beast is already defeated. This rev revelation is meant to show the reality of things, clarity that John sees from the wilderness, the truth, and that is that God has already conquered through lamikins. So don't surrender to a defeated enemy. Stay the course. That's John's message. Professor Boring has a whole section on how these verses get used to date the letter that we call Revelation. 
So like, you know, whenever you wonder, well, how do they know that it was written in 96 AD? So John says the first five emperors have fallen. And because John is thought to live in the time of the sixth emperor, people have tried to say, well, that must mean that this is written in the year. And then they put their preferred year in. But apparently, and again, I'm just leaning on Professor Boring here, it isn't clear which emperor should be the first one when you start counting. And there are some people credited with being an emperor who not everybody agreed should have been viewed as an emperor. And then we have to wonder, did John intend the number seven to be taken literally at all? Like maybe we should abandon the dating of Revelation based on a number that John oftentimes uses to be a symbol in and of itself. So this stuff is complicated, even for people who pour a lot of time and imagination into this. So Boring comes out at the end of all this conversation that I'm trying to boil down for you, and he says it this way. John is not writing a puzzle for later readers like us to figure out. He's writing a pastoral letter to address the immediate problems of his own day, and that was that their emperor was leading them away from God and toward a false god, a beast, you could say. John isn't trying to communicate who the emperor was, because the people of his own day would have known very well who, who the emperor already was. He was trying to communicate what the emperor was. Evil. An anti-lead-you-away-from-God kind of person. But in the midst of that, knowing that, that that's what John's trying to communicate, what the emperor meant, there's a surprising thing. As much as John's images are so over the top, he still stops short of suggesting that Rome has no value whatsoever. He talks about the sound of music and that Rome has built a civilization, that the voice of the bride and bridegroom will be replaced by a dead and haunted city. There is lament for the fall of Babylon. John knows there was some beauty that then got twisted and perverted. And there got to be far more ugly. In verses 15 to 18, we read of, a self of the self-destructive powers of evil, the beast and its allies, the ten kings. They turn on Rome and destroy it. So evil not only gets judged by God, but then destroys itself. Boring says God is the power behind all the thrones of this world, even of the power behind the power behind the thrones. And I like that. And then we come to chapter 18, the final climactic scene of woes that come before we hear about the kingdom of God. We're almost there. And here's something too, that these words are said not in the easy wisdom of hindsight, like long after Rome had fallen for real, but while Rome is at the height of its power and influence. I mean, John is writing when Rome is really at its height, it would be like somebody in 1941 in the, at the height of Germany's Third Reich proclaiming its fall and desolations. Like, it doesn't look like anything like that's going to happen anytime soon. It's way harder to say things like this in, in good times than obviously after their house of cards has collapsed. So we need to remember that, that John is saying all this about Rome uh, when, when Rome is at its strongest. And we might ask, because people at the time, you know, when, when an empire like Rome is at its height, it is seductive. I, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of its vibe, its wealth, its power. So people of John's day, people of our own day in the midst of any empire might ask, what's so wrong after all with Babylon? It's being singled out and lifted up as the example of evil. People might have been asking each other, what's so wrong about the ways of Rome after all? So, Boring comes up with a few examples that John could have just, you know, rattled off. Number one, John, John's lists of sins usually starts with Rome's idolatrous worship. The emperor cult especially pulls people away from God and toward a corrupt human. Number two, Rome's violence, especially against Jews and Christians, but the violence any empire uses against its own people whom they are meant to serve. That's perverted. And so that would be a second big reason of, of what's wrong with Rome. Number three, that Rome glorified herself instead of 
the higher power that is God. That's pride of the worst kind. Number four, wealth gained by inhuman ways. Boring makes the point that actual violence against Christians in John's time was still pretty rare. The more common problem was economic exclusion. For some to live in luxury at the expense of the poor, it's terrible, says John. So what are Christians to do? Well, notice he does not say Christians should now overthrow the government or get violent themselves. What John calls the churches to do is come out of her my people. And not literally, of course. This is not a geographical reorientation. He's not telling everybody to move. He's talking about an inner reorientation. Resist the values of the great city. Orient yourselves toward the, the, the justice of God, toward the holy city. Oh, and do what? one other thing. So first thing is, come out of her, my people. The other is, rejoice. The church does not have to postpone its celebration until the new Jerusalem descends, even amidst the injustices of the world. And without resigning ourselves to those injustices, like, well, what can you do? The church can already now join with the heavenly host, the saints, the apostles, the prophets, in celebrating the victory of God. Rejoice in the sure and certain hope that God's justice will be known to all of creation. All right, tomorrow, Revelation 19. We're going to hear hallelujah choruses and a lot more. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.